Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. The Honorable Court of Appeals of Tennessee is now in session. God save the United States, the state of Tennessee, and this Honorable Court. Be seated. Good morning to the attorneys and the litigants, if any. Uh, welcome to the Tennessee Court of Appeals. Eastern session, but it is the Court of Appeals period. Uh, your panel this morning consists of Judge Fryson, uh, Judge Davis, and myself, uh, Judge McClarity. Uh, I assume the time has already been, each party has already allotted for uh, their rebuttal time and so forth, have asked for it. <laughs> Madam Clerk, are there any preliminary matters? In that case, will you please call the first case? for the appellant. Are you prepared? Good morning, Your Honors. Good to be here. Good to be back live after doing, having done some of these on Zoom. My name is Mitchell Bryant. I'm a member of the McMinn County Bar. Uh, and I wanted to start out by telling, I'd like to reserve three minutes if I could uh, for rebuttal. And wanted to start out by telling the court this uh, is the hundredth case that I've had before an appellate court, exactly. uh, either this court, the Court of Criminal Appeals, the Tennessee Supreme Court, or the Sixth Circuit, and I realized that when I applied for a judicial uh, position and, and had to list the cases I had had. And it's also the first case that I've ever had um, where I did not have some part in the underlying trial. So let me go back to you reserving how many minutes? Three for, minutes, Your Honor, Three please. minutes for rebuttal. Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. Uh, just as I am here today, uh, I think on a somewhat unusual case, representing Mr. Ben Burke uh, on, a, on an order of protection, which is frankly, from my research, not something that comes before the court uh, a tremendous amount. Um, I would say that our trial courts, um, sometimes the majority of cases, there are orders of protection, typically without attorneys involved, uh, but in our district anyway, a lot of times these orders of protection uh, are more than half the docket, so it is somewhat unusual, I think, to see one come up on appeal, especially one that didn't have attorneys uh, in the first place. Um, Your Honors, what happened in this case? My client, Mr. Berg, um, used to live at a apartment complex in Athens, Tennessee called Town and Country Apartments. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's single, uh, lived there for a number of years, and during that time uh, cultivated somewhat of a friendship with the uh, appellee here, Mr. Mark Jackson. Uh, they were casual friends, they were not running buddies or social friends, or, and there was no relationship between them or anything of, of that nature. But at some point in time, that relationship soured. Um, I will say, and Mr. Burke is here, and I, I told him I meant no offense to him at all, but Mr. Burke is a, uh, is a pretty dogmatic individual. He's extremely conservative. Uh, he is retired phone company worker, but he's also a preacher uh, in, in the Athens area and, and devotes most of his time now to ministry and preaching and things of that nature. But, but he's, a, he's a, my mom will call him, he's an Old Testament type guy. He sees things black and white, right and wrong. Uh, he's a big man. He's a loud man. Um, and I've told him, frankly, probably is somewhat off-putting to people when they first see, see him and hear him. In this particular case, uh, and I know uh, in this case we had to do a transcript of evidence because there was no court reporter there, obviously. And uh, myself, I, I went on what Mr. Uh, uh, Burke had told me happened, and Mr. Winder went on what Mr. Jackson had told him because he wasn't involved either. And then Judge Denny said, well, you all are both kind of off, and he wrote a, a pretty comprehensive uh, statement of evidence or what he saw. And uh, uh, based upon that, it was fairly clear, I thought, in reading this that uh, when Mr. Burke appeared in the court, he was loud and got up and said this is not true I want to you know I'm I want to have a hearing on this said that a couple of times um, but what we pointed out uh, in this and I think it's important that we look at 
maybe the overarching purpose of orders of protection. They're found under the domestic abuse part of the statute. They've been in place since 1995, and, there's in, in, and in the statute it says the purpose of this is to recognize that domestic abuse and is a problem in the state of Tennessee, and that, uh, frankly, law enforcement in the past apparently had not taken it as seriously as confrontations between non-related persons and wanted to recognize that there was a need for this. And I think in this particular case, this is not what the order protection statute should be used for. This, I think it cheapens it. I think it makes it seem less serious because this appears to be from, from everything and there were a long handwritten petition filed by Mr. Jackson that covered a period of about two or three years where these folks had had frankly what I would call a bunch of petty disputes over um, Mr. Jackson lending some money to a woman and then Mr. Burke paying it back and thinking he was using illegal means to try to coerce her to pay it. Um, Mr. Burke believing that putting a ring doorbell up at his apartment because he thought there was drug dealing going on in the apartment complex, not by Mr. Jackson, but just a bunch of, I, I don't really know, just, just some problems between these two gentlemen. No violence, no threats of violence, um, nobody threatening anyone with a weapon. None of that happened. And so, the Counselor, uh, yes, sir. Would you address it, one of your issues here regarding the weight, uh, the uh, the mandatory uh, five-day period of notice? Would his appearing in court and saying that he was prepared and ready to proceed? Uh, would that uh, constitute waiver? Your Honor, what we argue, and I, and I know you've read the briefs and reviewed this, uh, we think that it has to be a knowing waiver of a right that you know you had. And there's no indication in the record that Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, Mr. Burke, realized that there that this he didn't have the statute and didn't know what the statute said, that he realized that there was a five-day notice requirement. He got this, these papers 36 hours, I think it was, before uh, the case was set. Got them on a Tuesday evening or afternoon, appeared on Thursday morning because the order said he had to appear. So, so he, he appeared without an attorney, um, hand wrote an answer because I think he thought that was what he, he meant to do. Now you can Wave and, and as Judge Jenny pointed out, he cited some cases about waiver, uh, but those cases, quite frankly, seem to deal with waiver of uh, procedural things, service of process problems, and things of that nature. Our argument is that, based upon its nature, the order protection statute we think is quasi-criminal in nature. Now, no Tennessee cases have said that. And, and we point that out. Other states have found that. But when you look at when you look at some of the consequences on an order of protection, a loss of Second Amendment rights, at least for the period of time that it's in place, the fact that you can be if for a violation, you can be arrested without a warrant, you can be found in criminal contempt, and you can be fined and or jailed for violating that. It, Mr. Bryant, let me ask you this. Is there any authority, were you able to find any authority to support the idea that somehow the judge had an obligation to say, hey, um, there's actually a five-day notice period and it's not in here, so do you want to, anything that says uh, there, that? There is, there is no authority that I could find specifically on that. And we, we looked at that, and that's why I said that when you talk about, when the courts talk about these quasi-criminal things, there appears to be they hold it to a higher standard. And obviously in a criminal case, defendants are afforded all sorts of rights. Um, uh, the, the testifying or not testifying at trial, you have to have a specific moment hearing uh, outside the presence of the jury where the judge explains exactly what the rights are. Um, we think that because of the consequences that come with the order of protection, that, that that should extend to, to these types of hearings as well, that the judge has to tell the person, you have, this is within the five-day period, you've got five days, uh, you have to specifically waive that. Uh, he, had no, he had no idea, he, he was under, like I said, he's a black and white guy. Got a court order telling him to be there, he was there. 
So, so if we find that, that there is an obligation on the part of the judge because it's a quasi-criminal matter, would we would be making new law essentially in Tennessee? You, you would. You would be. You would be putting Tennessee in the camp of, of some other out-of-state cases that we cited that, that find these types of hearings to be quasi-criminal. That's one thing we're arguing about here. Because as I was saying, the, the penalties for an order of protection go beyond, um, we talked about arrest without a warrant and things of that nature, but there's other things too, because you have an order of protection and I know one thought might be that this order of protection will expire fairly soon anyway. But it's an issue because if it's on your record that you've had one, it's going to cause you a problem buying a weapon or ammunition when you run a quick check. If you want to have a job where you have to be bonded, that's probably going to knock you out of that. If you want to work at Y12 or Sequoia or for a contractor, I guarantee it's going to knock you out of being able to do that because it'll pop up on a background check. So, um, and Mr., as I said, Mr. Burke uh, takes his Second Amendment rights extremely seriously. He's a lifetime NRA member, um, but you know, he does exactly, I mean, when he got this order protection, he brought his guns to my office and I gave him a receipt for him. So he, he does what he's, what he's supposed to do. But the other thing I would, I would point out, and this kind of goes to my se second argument. So we think, I guess basically we think this should have, this should be a, a this five day waiting period should be something that is, the judge informs him of specifically, let him make a knowing waiver of it if he chooses to do that, uh, just because of the seriousness of, of the underlying order of protection. We say that that did not happen. The second thing is that we think that we think, and I know this is a it was a bench tried case with a presumption of correctness on the judge's part, but even reading Judge Jenny's statement of evidence, we just don't think that this rose to to the, to the level of being able to do this. I know it's proponents of the evidence, and this is under the stalking part of the statute because there's no relationship between these. But the only definition for stalking that is given, and then this is in the order of protection statute, you actually have to refer over to the uh, statutory definition found at 3917.315, which is the uh, criminal statute on stalking and aggravated stalking, and it actually uses the word stalking victim in, in the definitions, and that talks about that it has to be traumatizing and a fear, and it has to be a real fear. In, in this particular case, and I think this is extremely important to point out, uh, and, it, and it's in the record when you see this, Mr. Burke had moved out of the town and country apartments in February of 2021. Um, and it said he was evicted from the town and country apartments. It had nothing to do with Mr. Jackson. It, it, it was because he was in a dispute with management there over parking spaces and his ring doorbell. So they basically said, you're too much of trouble, you gotta go. So he moved out, moved to another city, moved to Etowah, which is about 20 miles from Athens. Um, and then Mr. Jackson took this out in September, about eight months later. Uh, and it looks like, I mean, just from looking at it, it appears that uh, it was based upon Mr. Jackson telling the court that he saw a white truck drive by a piece of property he owned in another locale that looked like now, looked like Mr. Burke's truck. Didn't say so, Mr. Burke, just a truck look like Mr. Burke. And you might have seen in the record that Mr. Burke uh, presented some uh, phone, phone records where you could track where your phone had been, some kind of little maps to show that he wasn't wasn't there. But what the judge seemed to hang his hat on, in, in, in my opinion, just from reading this, was that Mr. Burke had said that he didn't know where this property was. Uh, and, and didn't and hadn't been around it. And then it when he test later on in his testimony, I think he may put that in his written statement. It, it, later when he testified, he said that he had been to the property once because Mr. Jackson had taken him there. Uh, so the judge felt like you know he knew where the property was, but I, I think that maybe was misconstrued. And, and I'm going to save the rest of my time for rebuttal. You have your vote. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yes, sir. Good morning. 
Uh, may it please the court, my name is Trey Winder. I'm an attorney in Athens, Tennessee. I've appeared before this court on multiple occasions, but I'm not as old as Mr. Bryan, and I've not been in front of you as many times as he has. I can make that joke. We're uh, not only colleagues, uh, but friends. Uh, I represent the appellee in this matter, uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Stanton Jackson. Uh, we believe, and we believe it's very clear to important things that the uh, appellant has offered no mandatory to go into the, the judge's question, no mandatory authority that, that calls for this matter to be overturned based on any current established Tennessee law, and also that the findings of the trial court, especially related to credibility and the findings of fact, rest comfortably within the discretion that the law affords the trial court. The appellant raises two issues. Happy to take both of those uh, on. There were several references made to Mr. Burke, what kind of man he is, what his history is. Um, and as Mr. Bryant said, he and I are both in the unique position that we are before you on a case that we did not try. We're, we're swimming in somebody else's bathwater here. That we are coming in with cases we didn't try. We didn't hear the facts. We didn't hear the proof. And while that might be unusual for us, it is not unusual for this court. You all review cases that you deal with all the time, that you weren't present in the courtroom, that you didn't hear the testimony, you didn't hear the facts. And because of that, you rely upon the trial court. And I think the trial court's findings in this matter, one, with a very detailed order based on his findings of fact and his accompanying conclusions of law, are clear as to the basis of why he made the decision he made and the reasons he made it. As Mr. Bryan also said, there were competing, uh, because of what we were told by our attorneys, competing suggestions as to what the record should come before you since there was not a trial court. And again, the trial court made a very detailed, very, very detailed report of its findings of fact, its conclusions of law. What we know from that record is that dealing first with the notice issue, that an order of protection was taken out. And I think in a very important thing to, to mention here, Mr. Bryant talks about the restrictions upon rights. Often those restrictions upon your rights happen immediately in an ex parte basis. Most orders of protection that do involve what he described, domestic relations matters, are granted on an, on an ex parte basis. This one wasn't though, was it? This one was right. not. And that's important in my opinion because when Mr. Burke came to court that day and was asked, the court points out he was asked on multiple occasions. First, the beginning call of the docket, are you prepared, do you want to have a hearing? I think that question is very much related to the issue um, of this five-day notice. Mr. Burke responded, yes. There's two time periods the statute forces trial judges to deal with with the timing of having these hearings. The first is that five days that you're entitled to the five-day notice, but you've also got about a two-week period. You've got to have that hearing within. But again, Mr. Burke was there under no, no restrictions. The ex parte was not. But you not. can kind of see the, the point of the appellant in this case. I mean, if you're served with an order of protection and you're a lay person, you don't know anything about the five-day notice requirement. You just know you've got an order from the court that says show up on this day. And you show up on that day, and if you don't have any idea that, that the time constraints are, are not correct, that you actually have more time, um, that you have the opportunity to get an attorney if you want to. If you don't know those things, how are you supposed to invoke those rights that you have if you're not aware of them? I think in this particular instance, there's two. I think there's a general answer to your question and a specific answer to Mr. Burke. The general act, answer is the practice of why it's important that on multiple occasions the trial court said, are you ready? Because as Mr. Bryant said, the majority of the docket on this date almost assuredly was orders of protection. And responses in instances where people said, no, I am not ready, they're afforded that time to get the attorney and the matter is rescheduled as a matter of general practice in our judicial district. Um, and again, I think the practice would have been then for Mr. Burke when he said, I'm ready, I'm prepared, I want to have a hearing. The record reflects that the court continued with its docket <coughs> and continued with every case that was there, took what it termed as shorter matters first, took this matter up last. So almost assuredly, other matters that were not prepared and were not ready were continued. Um, matters so he were should have piggybacked on what other people did and what he saw. I can just tell you from my perspective on orders of protection, I would find that whatever the first person did, everybody else did. Whether it was, yes, I'm ready to go, or no, I want some time. I 
think everybody the, else did the same thing. I think the other interesting thing about this specific case, and this goes to that pivot about the specifics of this case that's interesting, the trial court made references to part of the proof that came out of the relationship between Mr. Jackson and Mr. Burke was that Mr. Burke had harassed another individual, had received another order of protection, had had restrictions placed on him that included um, a restriction on his ability to possess firearms, and as part of that restriction, he had handed over at that time those firearms to Mr. Jackson. Uh, so again, in this instance, I believe that after concluding the shorter matters, continuing some, preparing with others, the record reflects he was asked again, are you prepared? And he said yes. Um, another part of the evidence that, that shows he was prepared, not only the filing of the answer, but also so the length and the duration of the hearing between these two individuals. The court trial court reflected that this was a multi-hour hearing, that they called and cross-examined multiple witnesses, uh, that they both put into evidence multiple, um, I think over a dozen each, just pieces of evidence or references to different parts of evidence. Um, and it shows uh, that he was prepared. And I think it's very important that goes to the, the Chafin case where we've referenced uh, that goes to your Honor McClarity's comment in, initially about waiver, that participation in a court proceeding serves as later or as waiver to later contest proper notice. By beginning this hearing, to, to do the alternative, to, to overturn this and, and say, uh, one, as you've stated, that we're creating new law, we're creating a, a, a new requirement creates a circumstance where Mr. Burke comes, says, yes, I'm ready, announces it in open court on multiple occasions, says, yes, I'm ready on multiple occasions, um, calls witnesses, cross-examines witnesses, files an answer, enters into evidence multiple um, exhibits that he believes support his opinion, has a multi-hour hearing, and then Mr. Burke's, Mr. Burke's problem here isn't with the procedure. Mr. Burke's problem is with the result. And what this is, is his attempt to get an appellate mulligan. And as the court, the trial court says in its initial order, referencing this where the motion for a new trial was de denied, one of the things Judge Jenny talks about is, is that there's not a prejudice to Mr. Burke because there was a lengthy hearing, a very lengthy hearing, multiple witnesses, multiple exhibits, that as part of doing that, the same proof with the same parties would go before the same judge for the same legal determination um, and that that removes any type of prejudice from Mr. Burke. Um, I also, with, as we deal with this question about notice and the question of quasi-criminal uh, matters, one of the things that the appellant references that to, to try to support the position that this is quasi-criminal is that there could be contempt, there could be civil contempt, there could be criminal contempt because of this order. That is true of any order of any court in the state of Tennessee that has contempt powers. That does not make every type of civil matter, therefore, a criminal matter. Um, the, the failure to follow an order can result in that in any type of any type of measure. Um, I also think it's important as you go back and and review the trial record. And I know the court has has done that. All members of the court. There are certain notices that are in the documents that are provided to an individual uh, alerting them to some of the consequences that can come of this matter. Uh, so we believe that there, there was not in any way um, any issue with the notice that he waived it. He very clearly waived it and the court references that on multiple occasions. <clears throat> Mr. Bryant made references that this isn't a case where there was violence or there were cases of threats of violence. That's because this is under the stalking provision. Uh, the, the, your honors are aware of the law, the domestic relations order of protection statute makes stalking a provision. It then goes in, tells us where to find the definition of stalking. It talks about the continued or repeated harassment. There is a definition of harassment in the code that talks about conduct that would cause a reasonable person to suffer emotional distress and that actually causes the victim to suffer emotional distress. The record reflects that my client testified that that was the case and there were several different things that were cited about this of the conduct. Um, that he was being followed by this individual, that he's seeing him at different places, he's being recorded. His neighbors testified that not only would Mr. my client be followed by Mr. Burke, but that after he would go visit other neighbors, Mr. Burke would go, would see them, would, would ask them about my client's conduct. Um, the court talks about that Mr. Burke says, oh, I've never been at his property 
property. Uh, but then, as, as we've all acknowledged, that, that the record we have is the only real proof of what happened in the hearing. The court says they'll know he testified he was at the hearing. Uh, so I think that becomes important when you have an individual coming to someone else's property that's at a different property. The record also reflected that Mr. Burke was removed from town and country because of his relationship and his inappropriate conduct with other residents um, with harassing. Mr. Bryant talks about that he's Old Testament or he's loud or he's very black and white. And, and that maybe the first time you see him, it's hard to deal with him. The, the record shows it's not the first time you deal with Mr. Burke that's the problem. It's the second. It's the third. Um, and, and all of these, the record reflects what he is, is he's a bully and he was a jerk to his neighbors. And it had people telling him to leave him alone. It had people telling him to stop. My client wrote him a letter, said, stop contacting me. That's in the record. I don't want to have any communication with you. The result is him sending other neighbors sermons where he calls my client wicked, where he's showing up around his house, where he's setting up dash cams and, and ring cameras to watch my, my client's comings and goings. He's leaving letters across the hall um, for my client to see when he walks out of his own apartment. He's bullying him, he's stalking him, he's harassing him. And when he's told and when he's asked, stop coming around me, stop bothering me, again, this is not a moment in time where everything was good with Mr. Burke and Mr. Jackson. This harassment is a continuing pattern of conduct that the trial court references in detail in multiple places related to the testimony of multiple witnesses of where Mr. Burke's conduct was inappropriate, it crossed the line, and it reached the level of harassment. The law talks about a reasonable person. If, you re if any reasonable person, just as Judge Jenny did, reads these this proof, here's this proof that was presented before Judge Jenny and substitutes themselves and says, do I want my neighbor to be following me? That every time they see me that they're staring at me, that they're asking my other neighbors about their whereabouts, that when I ask them to leave me alone, they won't. When I go to the trouble of building a new home somewhere else to be away from him, that he's coming around that piece of property to where he's teaching sermons and saying that I'm wicked. It's harassment. It just went on and on and on. And the only way that my client could get it to stop was through this order of protection. Mr. Burke didn't want it to stop. He wanted it to continue, in my opinion. That's why he's, he's fighting it. That's why it stopped. And again, his problem, in my opinion, is not, nothing related to process or procedure. There's no reference that Mr. Burke at any point in the trial court with Judge Jenny said, well, stop this train, I want to get off. I don't, I don't, I'm not prepared, I want my lawyer, I want a lawyer to be here. He didn't. He went to court and for hours argued with Mr. Jackson about this. That argument was part of his continuing pattern in a way of harassment. It was an opportunity for Mr. Burke to be face to face with Mr. Jackson and to cause him issues again. And, and he was fine with doing it. He was fine, as he said, on multiple occasions. As Mr. Uh, Bryant said, Mr. Bryant's opinion is he probably stood up and was loud when he said, I'm ready, I'm prepared. He stood up, he told the court he was ready, that he was prepared, watched other things happen, said it again, started it, never asked for it to stop, and never had a problem until he lost. Until the court said, no, just leave Mr. Jackson alone. You're ordered to leave him alone. You're ordered to stop harassing him because your harassment is stalking and he's entitled to be protected from you under the order of protection because your harassment rises to the level of stalking. None of us, I would say respectfully, would want to substitute ourselves for the position Mr. Jackson was in being submitted to the conduct of Mr. Burke. And that's why Judge Jenny provided him the protection. I have approximately a minute left, it appears, and happy to answer any questions. I hear none. Thank all you right. very much. I'm one closer to catching up with Mr. Bryant. Thank you, you all. <laughs> Appreciate you all very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Your rebuttal, sir? Yes, Your Honor. In, in response, uh, I want to address this idea that Mr. Burke had had a prior order of protection. There was a prior order of protection several years before in another uh, in Hamilton County. What we're looking for, is that in the record? It is. Uh, there, there's, a, there's something said about it, by, I think, by Judge Gene in the record. Uh, 
in that particular case, it involved a divorce he was involved in. Uh, both parties had counsel, and as I understand it, the, the court in Hamilton County ended up dismissing that. So a little bit different situation. He had counsel dealing with that, and there was counsel on both sides. The, the thing I would point out, Mr. Winder talked about this being a, a continuous stream of harassment. Uh, the, the quote unquote following and things of that nature, these parties lived in the same apartment complex uh, and there's there's this uh, something about a laundromat, that's the laundry room at the, at the apartment complex. They would by nature have contact with each other, they lived in the same building. On a, on a weekly basis at least. But at the time this was taken out, uh, Mr. Burke had been gone for eight months. Uh, and, and the reason, as I said, uh, I think that was a mischaracterization as to why he was gone. Uh, he, he was gone just because he got into dispute with management there uh, about, about his ability to have a ring doorbell and not have a ring doorbell and some kind of dispute about parking spaces. So uh, I guess at the end of the day, the. Uh, apartment complex decided he was too much of a of a headache to deal with so they just said well we're not going to rent to you anymore didn't have anything as i'm as far as i'm aware nothing in the record to deal with mr jackson and, and i would also point out that mr jackson is eight months after mr burke left that mr jackson took out this order of protection uh, apparently based upon the fact that he saw a truck that looked like mr burke's uh, he said driving by a piece of, and I don't think he was moving into another home, it's just a piece of property he had out somewhere, some kind of storage building or shed, I think. And uh, you, you'll see in the record also that he, Mr. Jackson accused, said there was a no trespassing sign on a fence or a chain on the front of the driveway and that somebody had bent the sign over and uh, he, he accused Mr. Burke of that. The judge found there wasn't any proof that Mr. Burke uh, had actually done that. Um, Let me ask you this. Um, so it, does the record bear out that after Mr. Burke left during the eight month period before um, Mr. Jackson took out the order of protection, you, what else allegedly happened other than the truck driving by? I, I don't think there's anything else. I, as far as I recall in the record, I don't think there's anything else in the record about any contact. So everything else proof-wise had to do with things that happened while they were living while together? They were, well, yes, Or in the same apartment Yes, complex. while they were living in the same complex. Okay. And, and from 2019 to February of 2021. Uh, also, we're not asking the court to do a new requirement. We're just asking them to asking the court to enforce the notice requirement in the law as it's written now. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you to the attorneys. Your case has now been submitted to the Tennessee Court of Appeals. Uh, you should receive our opinion and order within a reasonable period of time. Thank you both for your Thank presentation. You. Thank you. You may be excused.